So hello everybody and welcome to another webinar from Head Acoustics. This is going to be a applications oriented webinar and we are super happy that you have decided to join us today. My name is Jacob Sondergaard. I will be your host today and we'll be talking about audio conferencing solutions. Specifically, we'll focus a little bit on the hardware as well as some basic testing. Part of what we would like to share with you today is of course going through the schematics and the block diagram overview of the hardware that we're using to do the testing. That includes the background noise simulation software. And then we will be talking about some of the key parameters that affect speech and conversational quality of conferencing terminals. And to help us illustrate that point, we would like to draw on some real devices and put them through the ringer and share some results from those devices. And as mentioned at the end of the day, we'll have a little bit of time for discussion and Q&A. Now, from a very fundamental standpoint, let's look at the basic test setup. So in the top left-hand corner, you'll see that we have a PC running our Aqua software. That's the piece of software that handles all the signal generation and the signal analysis. We are interacting with our LabCorp front end, which will serve dual purpose of interacting with our device under test. So if we are talking about a hands-free terminal, we could connect up using USB, voice over IP, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and maybe even use some reference clients on or off the LabCorp. The other purpose of the lab core is to control the signals going to and from the head and torso. The head and torso, of course, represents a human being in the sound field. That would be us and our acoustic interaction with the device. Now, because we're talking about audio conferencing solutions, it doesn't have to be a hands-free terminal. It could just as well be a headset. So I am talking to you guys on a headset right now, for instance. So the basic configuration is going to be exactly the same, except in this case, our DUT is going to be head worn. We'll have it on the head and torso, and we'll still be interacting with the device in much the same way. Now, if we want to look at a more complete test setup, this is the setup that we are using for today's examples and today's test. So if you bear with me, I know there's a lot on this slide, but I do want to make it clear what it is we're doing. In the top right hand corner, you have a PC that's running Aqua. That's the main piece of software that controls everything. We're connected via USB to the lab core and the lab core then serves that purpose of controlling the head and torso or head and torsos because for conferencing devices, one of the things that we find extremely important is the ability for that device to be able to handle multiple talkers. So our lab core needs to be able to do that. If we jump into the test chamber, you can see that we, our little device under test is mounted on a table that can rotate because we want to make sure we can test multiple angles of these multiple talkers and um, we have a turntable underneath there. Now, for our specific use case, we are connecting to a conference client using Bluetooth and that conference client is connected, hardwired into our router along with our reference conference client on the far left-hand side. It's the guy over here. He's connected to a sound card, which we then uh, connect to our lab core using AES-EBU, so that we're able to send digital audio signals to the conference client and to our device under test. And then we can also interact with the head and torso and close the loop that way. Now, part of today's goal is to talk about basic test setup. And what we consider part of basic testing is also the ability to generate background noises. So on that same PC in the top right hand corner, you will see that we also have a version of 3Pass running. 3Pass of course is the software that we use for background noise recording and playback. Most of those signals will be routed right through the lab BGN and then through a series of passive amplifiers. And then you can already see we have our eight loudspeakers in the chamber ready for the actual playback. Now, just a quick note about 3Pass. This is the software that complies with Etsy standard TS103224. 
and is what we call an MPNS, multi-point noise simulation system. What that means is we use eight microphones in a specific array for our background noise recordings. And then we use the same eight microphone array to equalize out all the effects in the chamber and calculating all the delays, FIR, IR filters that need to be applied to each of the eight channels, each of the eight loudspeaker channels, so that when we hit play on our background noises, they are reproduced exactly as they were when we recorded them. And so when we now look at the complete schematics, you can see that we have total control over our device, the head and torsos, and the background noise environment, and we can actually get one step closer to replicating a complete audio conferencing scenario. Now, this slide is really just intended for your review purposes. I won't go into a ton of detail, but I do want to mention that there are a whole host of international standards that we can rely on that cover the speech quality and conversational quality test specifications, specifically for hands-free terminals and you can see that there is, of course, standards written for the different bandwidths. And the one I do want to highlight is specifically ITUT P340 because the standard there is something that we draw on heavily for hands-free terminal testing. And especially if you look at Amendment 2, which is as recent as January 2019, <clears throat> excuse me, that Amendment 2 to ITUT P340 is very crucial for multi-talker testing. That's something that we will cover in two weeks time when we look at advanced testing. Now, all these standards are going to be free to download. So if you load up the Google machine, you can go and find these standards, download them, study them, read them. They're very valuable resources. So let's invite you into the Head Acoustics Lab. This is very literally what our test setup looks like for this particular scenario. We have our two head and torsos bolted to the chairs. We have a three pass system with eight loudspeakers. Not all eight are visible from this angle, but you'll also notice that our DUT is mounted on a one meter tabletop on top of our turntable. So we have the ability to rotate our device. And here's a different angle. I do want to point out that the DUT in this photo is purely representative. It's not a device that we were using for this particular experiment. So any of the data that you see is not associated with this device. But hopefully this angle and the next angle gives you a good idea of what the test setup is like. Here's a better picture, a better angle of the turntable. Now, a couple quick comments about the devices that we're using. Both of them are considered quote unquote small and portable Bluetooth speakerphone devices. So keep that in mind when we start looking at the results. And then just to be clear, each of the devices were put under identical test conditions. So as we recall from the schematics, we were paired using Bluetooth to a near end client laptop and we had our call established to the far end reference client. We were connected hardwired actually through the router using ethernet. And then the far end reference client had the DSP disabled. What that means is anytime we see data from the device, we can be sure that we are only looking at signals that have been processed by our DUT and not by the reference client. Now the far end reference client is then connected to the lab core <clears throat> and subsequently Aqua using a sound card and then the AES EBU cable. So if everybody's clear on that, I think we are now ready to get testing. So maybe you've seen a chart like this before, but all of these parameters here are important. And in some sense, these parameters are all going to be generic in the sense that they can really be applied to almost any type of device. It doesn't have to be an audio conferencing device. But since we are talking about audio conferencing today, what I would like to do is concentrate on the parameters that are going to be particularly interesting for our topic. In this case, we'll be talking about delay and delay. 
So we want to measure delay obviously in the sending direction and in the receiving direction. We want to talk about echo and double talk performance as well as speech quality in the presence of background noise. I think with these KPIs, so key performance indicators, we can already start to form a pretty good picture of what our devices are going to look like in a real conversational scenario. I'll touch on each of these individually and why they really matter for what it is that we're doing. Now, let's start with delay. This is our first test parameter. And just to define it, we're talking about delay, meaning the latency between when speech is sent to when speech is received. So we're really just adding up all the processing time and processing blocks and transmission paths inside of our DUT to figure out how much delay does it add to the conversational path. Now, why is this important? Well, it really doesn't matter from a speech quality perspective, but from a conversational quality perspective, too much delay can severely degrade that experience. Number one, it can cause our echo cancers to work much, much harder if it has to compensate for super long delays. Number two, it very quickly introduces unintended double talk. So if you recall from our late April webinar, we talked about unintended double talk and we presented some examples of various delays and how it shifts from the orthotelephonic experience of standing face to face. And once we start adding just 150 milliseconds of delay, that's sort of the threshold of where people are still comfortable. Once we get beyond that, things get a little harder from a conversational experience. So, and if we introduce way too much delay, the unintended double talk means that the conversational experience gets reduced from rather than a conversation into more of a military broadcast situation. So we wanna be very diligent about keeping our delays low. Now, of course, the root cause of long delays is that we're just not paying attention to the audio path. So each of these blocks that we'll talk about in a little bit, they all add their own processing time. It's unavoidable, but we have to keep an eye on how long we're spending in each section. And then with audio conferencing, unfortunately, there are a lot of things outside of our control number one being the network itself. We don't have any control over that as a device uh, manufacturer. So let's just very briefly go through the block diagram here to give you a sense of where we are in terms of delays. So if we start in the middle of the slide, you can see that we have a blue block that says uh, speech processing in it, but that represents our accessory which is paired via Bluetooth to a client of some sort. This is very literally the situation that we have for our test here. Our small Bluetooth audio conferencing device has a microphone for accepting speech. It has some processing. It could be some noise suppression, beam forming, um, automatic gain control being applied. And then we go through the Bluetooth transcoding process and into our client, which hopefully has deactivated all the speech processing before it then transcodes onto the network. And I know it says 4G here. We specifically were using just uh, ethernet data packets, uh, but really any type of network protocol. We're talking about non-speech transmission. We're talking about just data transmission here, and it could be any network type that you want, but there's some type of transcoding taking place and then a delay associated with it. Now, before I switch down to the receive direction, I do wanna say that specifically when we're using Bluetooth, if you are following the Bluetooth conventions and you pair an accessory to a gateway, then the accessory should send as a very first command, NREC equals zero, which means noise reduction, echo cancellation off. So the accessory should tell the client or the gateway that, hey, I will handle noise reduction, echo cancellation. I will handle the speech processing. Go ahead and switch it off. Now, that is an ideal situation. The thought being, while the accessory probably has more information about the uh, actual acoustic space and can better apply the processing there, um, we obviously don't want a serial implementation as that could severely reduce our speech quality and potentially even the overall noise suppression. And of course, you can see up here when we start talking about delays and why it matters, 
if we're skipping a whole 100 millisecond block of processing, that means our delays drop significantly and improves our expectations from a conversational perspective. So very quickly at the top, you can see depending on how heavy you are with the amount of processing, you could add anywhere from 10 to 70 milliseconds. There's not a whole lot we can do about the Bluetooth transcoding, but again, if you're, you know, if you're following protocol here and we can disable and bypass this processing step altogether, we can save a lot of processing time. And then again, depending on what type of network we're on, we could see some varying delays. This is all in the sending direction. Now, somebody has to receive that signal, of course. And if we're looking at your device again, or our device, as it were, we're receiving a signal. Hopefully, we will be bypassing this processing block on board the client before we transcode via Bluetooth to our accessory, where we again apply some speech processing. At this stage, you can see that the numbers tend to be small in the receiving direction, and that's very common. The thought being, whatever signal we get from the network has already been optimized as much as possible. So the amount of processing in the receive direction is typically lower, maybe some volume control, maybe some spectral shaping, but nothing too intensive is typically applied in the receive direction. In any case, those numbers start to add up. Now, to put that into perspective, let's take our two devices. Uh, they'll be known as device one and device two. They'll always be displayed device one on the left, device two on the right to make things easy and clear. Now, I've given you the numbers already up front down below. You can see they are large, to put it bluntly. Um, but what I do wanna say is the way that we do the delay measurement is that we do a cross-correlation analysis where we analyze where we have the highest correlation between the resulting output of the device and the input to the device. So we're, we're correlating the two, and wherever we have the highest correlation, that also happens to be the delay value. So for device one, you can see in green, we have almost 450 milliseconds of delay in the sending direction. That is a long time. It's a half second worth of delay just to get the signal off the device and into the network. In the receive side, it's obviously better, but we're still talking about 274 milliseconds. That's a fair amount of time we are processing those signals. Device two though, you can see better. We're talking about 340 milliseconds in the sending direction and 223 in the receive direction. So if we were to score this, which we will, we're gonna score this on a scale of one to four or minus two to plus two. Minus two minuses is going to be the worst one minus is going to be slightly below average. We have a single plus sign and then two plus signs for very good. So in this case, yeah, device one, that is really, really long. And remember we talked about, you know, the, the consequences of adding delay. <clears throat> Our echo cancer is gonna to have to work harder. We're gonna introduce unintended double talk. It's going to be difficult to have conversations when delays are this long. Frankly, this is something that needs to be improved. This is a double minus experience on device number one. Device two is better but they're still long and there's still room for improvement. So we're gonna give this a single minus sign. Now, quick conclusion though is device number two appears to be more likely to be better in a conversational scenario because the delays are shorter. So that's where we're starting. Device two has maybe a slight edge. Now let's move to echo. Echo, of course, is when our device under test is receiving a signal and unfortunately then bouncing back or relaying back some of that same signal up to the cloud or up to the far end. That's not what we want. But the reason why this matters is, is twofold. It impacts the talker experience dramatically. So I'm sure you've been on a call where somebody has a poor echo canceller and that means when you're talking to them, you hear your own voice. And that's incredibly distracting if you are trying to talk to somebody and you hear your own voice. So it, it really degrades that experience. And then again, from a conversational experience, it's going to be hard to have that conversation if there's a lot of echo present. Now, you know, the, the layperson might confuse receiving echo as being a problem with their own device. But as I'm sure you guys know, echo is something that is taking place on the other side of the call, so it's the other person's device. And then just to be clear, we wanna state that echo is not 
always going to be full, audible, recognizable voice. <clears throat> it could just as well be screeching, scratching noises that are showing up electrically through the system. Now, the root causes here, obviously we talked about lawn delays. It does make it a lot harder for the echo canceller. And um, simply just having a poorly tuned echo canceller or non-existent echo canceller, which uh, doesn't happen so much anymore, but it's definitely going to be one of the root causes of echo showing up in your system. Now, where does echo come from? Let's take this example here where we have two friendly people that are trying to have a conversation. Our, the lady on the left-hand side is going to be our far-end talker. She's going to be communicating to the gentleman on the right-hand side. He's going to be the near-end listener. So what's going to happen is, in this case, they're both on cell phones. There's no Bluetooth accessory in this particular diagram, but the lady's voice is going to be picked up by the microphone. There'll be some speech processing applied. We'll simply transcode directly to the RF and 4G network, let's say, and then received on the near-end listener side, and then audio will be transmitted to the gentleman listening. Now, what's going to happen is that there are multiple potential paths where echo could show up. And the lady could be hearing her own voice or some other noises as a result of poor echo canceller performance or network performance. So, you know, the first one is there could be some echo artifacts showing up in the network or during the transcoding uh, effects on the device, uh, on the near end device. We could have other electrical paths. And then of course, I think the one that we're generally most concerned about is the acoustic echo. And the also, when I say acoustic echo, it really also could be uh, structurally introduced. So vibration echo. And this is even going to be a bigger issue when we talk about hands-free audio conferencing devices because those devices typically have larger drivers, you're in a hands-free situation, uh, speech is going to be presented louder at the near end. <clears throat> it's going to be a tougher situation for an echo cancer to deal with in that situation. But you can see we have multiple paths that we could potentially run into. So we have to test this in multiple different ways in order to gauge how good this is. Now the first step we want to take is Let's look at echo loss. Sometimes it's called TCLW. That's specifically for the narrow band case because TCLW stands for terminal coupling loss weighted. In this case, uh, it's very much not narrow band. So we're just talking about echo loss. Sometimes just TCL, terminal coupling loss. But it's all going to be representative of a single number. We're looking at the magnitude of the signal reaching the device and then we're looking at the magnitude of the signal that is leaving the device basically the echo turn signal that ratio is going to be our echo loss device number one seemingly fantastic performance we've also shown the spectrum here so you can see there's no spurious frequency effects but device number one gives us 94 db of echo loss so a huge amount of attenuation um, on the echo return path. And device number two still manages a very capable 67 dB of echo loss. So again, if we were to score this, well, seemingly device number one is the clear winner. Device number two, though, still does a, a good job. We'll give it a single plus sign. Now, before we move on, let's just take a look at the time domain and see if there's anything there. The first device, um, nothing is just absolutely nothing, which is fantastic. There's no echo whatsoever. Uh, device number two, maybe a little bit more interesting to look at because there's stuff going on. And the time domain graph is showing us that there's a four distinct echo bursts, if not more, showing up. And then there are these funny, regularly spaced pulses. They're not technically echo. They're actually comfort noise. We won't dive into that now, but clearly we have some issues in the time domain with device number two. So if we were to score this again, device number one, great, not a hint of echo. Device number two, well, unfortunately, there's something here that could be rather detrimental to the experience. 
Now, very much related to Echo is, let's look at Double Talk Performance. So Double Talk Performance, we're specifically looking for the amount of attenuation that occurs during Double Talk. And we want to look at two Double Talk scenarios. We want to look at what we call the completely overlapping scenario, sometimes known as segment two, sometimes known as heavy double talk. It's when both the far end and the near end are talking full sentences at the same time. And then we also have what we call single word bargain, sometimes known as segment one, sometimes known as light double talk. And that's when the far end is talking full sentences and the near end is trying to interrupt with a single word like yes, hey, no, stop, please stop, to varying degrees of success. Now, of course, why does the duplex performance or the double talk performance matter? Well, if you have the ability to talk while the other person is talking, then that greatly improves the conversational experience, much like the orthotelephonic uh, reference position. When we talk face-to-face, -face, we have the ability to talk at the same time that's the goal for audio conferencing solutions as well. If, however, the devices are attenuating the near-end speech severely, well, you don't have that ability to communicate while the other person's talking. We now degrade to more of a push-to-talk experience where you have to wait until the other person is done before you can relay your message. Now, just very briefly about the measurement process. The first thing we do is we take a known speech file and we send the near end speech only. And we measure the level versus time of that near end speech in the uplink direction. And we store that level versus time trace. Then we repeat the exact same speech file, but now we have the near end speech and the far end speech at the same time, but we still measure the level versus time trace in the uplink direction. So what we can do now is we can compare the differences the first run, the single talk run, is going to be essentially the ideal scenario. When we run it again, well, that's going to be the real scenario where we see how well does it perform relative to the ideal. So we do some subtraction to normalize AGCs and spectrums. We then do some histogram math to sort of remove the extremes and really only focus on the uh, essential portion of the speech and then we calculate the median attenuation range. We then evaluate that separately for the light and heavy or the word and sentence double talk, however you want to classify it. And we slot that attenuation, the double talk attenuation into a ITUT P340 category table like the one below, where if we see less than three dB of attenuation occurring of that near end speech during double talk, that's what we would call a full duplex device and we would call it a type one device. And you can see as we, we increase the amount of attenuation that occurs of that near end speech, well, we start to progress through the partial duplex, the type twos, all the way down to no duplex, type three, that's if we see median attenuation of more than 12 dB. In other words, that's where you'll have a really hard time barging in and duplexing and talking at the same time. So now let's get to the interesting bit here. Let's look at the double talk results from our two devices. The first thing is you'll see on the time domain charts that there's going to be a difference between the single talk and the double talk. And I apologize in advance to our colorblind friends. The green trace is going to be the single talk. So that's when we had near end speech only. And then the double talk is going to be the red trace. That's when we had the near end speech while there was far end speech. So anytime that you have, and the black just shows the overlap between the two, but anytime you have lots of green and a little bit of black, that means that it's going to be heavy attenuation. So very quickly comparing the two devices, you can see device one, there's going to be a lot more attenuation occurring on average. And sure enough, our calculations from the metric tells us there's an average or median attenuation of almost 31 dB. That's clearly down in type three categories. Now for the device number two, we're hovering awfully close to type three. Remember the threshold was 12 dB. In this case, it's 11.8 dB. So technically a type two C. 
I like to play you these files just so you can get a sense of what it sounds like. So this is going to be the barge in person trying to say the utterance five to varying degrees of success. Five. 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 Especially that last one, that would have been very difficult to detect if you were talking and somebody, all they said was that little blip right there. Now, uh, just to give you a frame of reference, here's device two. Five. 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 So we could spend an awful lot of time talking about this, including the fact that when we see a lot more red than green, it means that we have some echo components. But suffice it to say, if we were to score these, well, the device one is fairly atrocious, not very good at all. We're going to give it two minuses. Device two is better, but a type two C is not really something we want to aspire to. We're going to give that a single minus sign. Now let's look at the heavy double talk or the full overlapping sentences. Basically the same picture starts to form. You can see in the time domain, we have all kinds of things going on with device one, lots of attenuation, also a fair amount of echo during double talk. And especially this fourth utterance is fairly bad. Sure enough, our median attenuation is going to be almost 30 dB. That's type three. Device number two, Similar picture, although it appears to be doing an admiral job of at least trying to maintain some form of speech throughout all four of the utterances. And the numbers are a little bit better. It's 6 dB. What I'd like to do is play these files for you and you can listen and judge to see if there is a noticeable difference. Even though both are technically type three, I'd like for you to listen to it. Vicky Barn fell with a loud flash. Bright rose without leaves. Pencil with black lead right. In the eyes of the... And then here's device two. The shaky barn fell with a loud crash. But a bright rose without... A pencil with black lead right. The glow people in the eyes of the girl. So you can see device two is really doing the best that it can and we would grade it better. It is 6 dB better, even though they're both type three, we're gonna give the nod to device number two. It's still not good. We still want that experience to be a lot better, but that's the way it turned out. Now, let's switch gears and talk about three quest. So three quest in general, of course, is a MOS metric. And this slide I'll leave for some reference later on for you to review. Uh, suffice it to say, there are some pros and cons. In general, we are very much in favor of using MOS metrics for our testing because, frankly, they tend to be cost effective, a lot less time consuming, and allow you to very quickly speed through development and get you to a really good state uh, with your device tuning profile. Three Quest specifically, it has been through some evolution. It's been adopted uh, widely in the industry, so voice industry in general and communications. Um, and suffice it to say, I just want to draw your attention to the bottom three lines here, sort of regardless of which version of 3Quest you're using, the common output is always going to be that we have a speech quality predictor, SMOS. We have a noise reduction or noise suppression quality predictor that's going to be the NMOS portion, and then the overall or global quality predictor is going to be the GMOS. Those are the parameters that we have to work with. And just from a trying to convey this message, you know, and what it means in human terms is if you're looking at SMOS, well, you know, we're looking at not just SNRs and, and the improvement that you might get before and after the processing has been applied, but we're also looking at things like the modulation that's occurring to the speech, how the speech sounds and the naturalness of the speech. You know, this is a lot more than just intelligibility. 
Uh, on the NMOS side, of course, we're looking at absolute levels or loudness of the background noise, but I think more importantly is we're looking at the potential modulations and disturbances of the background noise, because really what we want to do is we want to try and correlate that to the quote unquote intrusiveness of the background noise. So as you may be aware, the human ear functions in a very particular way where it might be favorable to have slightly higher background noise levels in absolute terms if it is steady state without any transients as opposed to maybe being too aggressive and you end up with these unintended pumping noises or screeching noises in the background noise simply because the human ear will have an easy way to adapt to the steady state noise and it would be very much attuned and sensitive to changes in level. But that's really what NMOS is doing. And then GMOS, it's not just a linear summation or average of SMOS and NMOS. It's typically fed through a neural network, and it really correlates to some overall impression of the speech and noise suppression of the complete signal. That being said, let's look at how our two Bluetooth devices perform. Now, first thing is, again, I've shown you the time domain plots of the two device uh, performance. In both cases, the green trace is going to be the process signal. That's the signal that our device sends to Aqua or to the far end. The unprocessed signal, that is the signal that's captured with a reference mic as close to the DUT mic as possible. So that unprocessed signal is going to be the raw speech plus noise combination. And then what we ideally want to see is the process signal, remove all the noise, and then ideally maintain the speech quality as best as possible. Now, we see the GMOS, SMOS, and NMOS scores for each of the devices at the bottom. You see the time domain plots, nothing really sticks out in either case. Both devices perform fairly well. I do have two eight second samples that I want to play with you, or play for you because when we did a quick internal poll within the company, it was really hard to find people that had a preference for one or the other. And I guess fortunately, 3Quest is giving us basically the same thing. They're awfully close. So let me just play these quick eight second samples and you can get a sense of why it's hard to choose between one or the other. A young child should not suffer fright. The stray cat gave birth to kittens. So pretty good speech quality, a little bit of background noise, nothing too wild or exciting. Here's device two. A young child should not suffer fright. The stray cat gave birth to kittens. A little bit different, but overall, you know, sounds pretty good. As a result, we've given both of these devices a single plus sign. Now, for those of you keeping score at home, this is what we covered today. We talked about delays for both of these devices, and you can see on the right-hand side, we have sort of a scorer's table. We would prefer device number two. Now, we put that result in bracket because it's not to say that device number two is good by any stretch of the imagination. We still see room for improvement, but it is the better of the two. Now for echo, remember we looked at both uh, the single number, TCL, echo loss, we looked at the frequency domain and the time domain. In both cases, device one appeared to be the much better device, clearly. Now let's switch and look at the double talk section because maybe one of the issues with having such an aggressive echo canceller for device number one is the fact that it is almost completely unable to duplex and handle double talk in any capacity. So in this case, device number two maybe performs a little bit better. And when we revisit the echo scores, maybe device number one isn't the best after all, even though the numbers technically were better or higher. Now, finally, 3Quest. The 3Quest scores were fairly even. We could take or leave either one. They're both acceptable. We don't really have a strong preference one way or the other. So in our opinion, looking at this, we see that maybe device number two is going to be slightly preferred for conversational situations. 
but that's not to mean that device number two is good. There's still lots of room for improvement. So I will leave you with this rhetorical question, which one would you pick based on these key performance indicators? And now to wrap things up, I think the two key messages that we wanted to leave you with today was the fact that Head Acoustic spends a lot of time and energy and expertise on perfecting these test solutions, right? Head Acoustics is the premier voice quality and conversational quality test solution provider. And we have the tools to do all this and assist you with this type of work. Number two, when you are testing these types of devices, there isn't always a clear winner. And even though one device can outperform another or seemingly outperform another, this particular example that we showed today was actually a really good representation of how it can be difficult based on these key performance indicators. And then maybe leads to the fact that A, we need to do more testing and certainly we need to use the tools available to us to maybe go back to the lab and do a little fine tuning and see if we can't optimize the devices one way or the other based on the KPIs that you have selected that are important to you or to your device performance or to your application. And so just to wrap this thing up, I do want to remind you that we have a whole microsite just dedicated to audio conferencing solutions. It's called optimizeaudioconferences.com. We have our white paper up there from our April activities. We have links to webinar videos. And of course, I want to make you aware of the fact that we have two weeks from now, a webinar, part two in this series, where we look at the more advanced tests, including things like multi-talker scenarios. And instead of comparing devices, we will be sharing data that compares the conference um, systems or the um, audio conference providers, so the software solutions themselves. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attendance. We hope you found this interesting and informative. Please reach out to Head Acoustics if you have any further questions regarding voice and conversational quality testing, and we will be more than happy to help you. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.